Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Jessica Hare, Vice President of Outreach here at American Promise. And I first want to start by thanking you all for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us tonight on our monthly American Promise Connect National Call. Our monthly American Promise uh, Connect National Call is a simple, simply a conversation with some of our top leaders in America. And tonight we are fortunate enough to have Representative Jamie Raskin. And tonight he will be discussing his book, Unthinkable, Trauma, Truth, and the Trials of American Democracy. So if you do not have a copy of his book or you haven't had a chance to read it on your Kindle or whatever you use to read books on, I highly encourage you to read this book. It is a great, great, great read. And tonight, Representative Raskin will be describing the 45-day period in 2020 when he lost his son, unfortunately, to suicide. And only a week later, with his daughter by his side, he faced an unfortunate attack on our nation's capital. So he will also share how these experiences have um, reinforced the need to protect our democracy and how the current crisis that we are dealing with is really affecting um, the mental health of many Americans, especially our young people. So I guarantee you tonight that you will leave this call feeling empowered and inspired to take action. And again, if you have not had a chance to read his book, I highly encourage you to go get your copy and please make sure you take a good, good, good read with his book. Um, unfortunately, I am not able to join you all tonight. My daughter Morgan, it is her birthday. She is turning 13. So with that being said, we are out celebrating her and I want you all to make sure you say happy birthday, Morgan, because now I have a 13 year old. <laughs> so I will turn everything over to Jeff Clements, our president at this time, to proceed with our American Promise Connect national call. Thank you all again for your attendance. Well, thank you, Dr. Jessica. Dr. Jessica Hare, our Vice President of Outreach at American Promise. And welcome uh, to everybody. And I should say, of course, happy birthday to Morgan and Dr. Jessica. Thanks for being with us. Uh, we want to welcome all of you uh, to tonight's American Promise Connect conversation with Congressman Jamie Raskin. Uh, I'm Jeff Clements, President of American Promise. And at American Promise, we are uniting Americans to stop the corruption of our political system, check the billions of dollars of election spending from super PACs, dark money entities, even foreign interests now, trying to destroy the representation and voice of we the people. Uh, together, we're winning the nonpartisan campaign for our For Our Freedom Amendment to the US Constitution to fix this problem once and for all. I have to say I uh, first, um, had a conversation with a law professor about this idea of a constitutional amendment not long after the Citizens United decision. Uh, he helped write a good constitutional amendment to fix the problem. That law professor at the time was Professor Jamie Raskin, now a lead sponsor in Congress of the very constitutional amendment that can do so much to repair our herd in Republic. Um, I wanna thank our co-sponsors, and then we're going to get right to Congressman Raskin and my friend Deborah Winger, um, who are ready to go. But we have some wonderful co-sponsors who brought so many people together um, here and on Facebook Live. Uh, welcome to our friends joining on Facebook Live. Our co-sponsors, Public Citizen, you can see them at citizen.org, People for the American Way at pfaw.org, the Brennan Center for Justice, brennancenter.org, and fairvote, fairvote.org. Thank you to all of our co-sponsors in the, bringing together this really important conversation. Um, as Dr. Jessica said, if you have uh, not read the book, uh, I hope you'll have a chance to read Unthinkable, Truth, Trauma, and the Trials of American Democracy. Uh, it is Jamie Raskin's story of despair and survival. On December 20, 31st, 2020, Congressman Raskin and his wife, Sarah Bloom Raskin, lost their beloved 25-year-old son, Tommy, to suicide. A week later, the day after the funeral, Jamie fulfilled his duty to be in Congress with the other members of the House, the Senate, Vice President Pence, ready to ensure 
the secure count of the certified electoral college votes from the states, a count that would confirm the election of President Joe Biden. As Jamie describes in the book, Congressman Raskin, I should say, before the count could be completed, the Capitol was attacked by a violent mob, fought hand-to-hand -hand combat to overcome and wound 150 Capitol Police, violently take over the House and Senate chambers, destroying property and seeking to inflict violence on Vice President Pence, Speaker Pelosi, and many others. While his daughter Tabitha and son-in-law Hank sheltered behind a barricaded Capitol office, Jamie and the other members had to regroup in a secure location, but they made sure that the count was finished well into the early morning hours the next day. Unthinkable is a story of grief, perseverance, determination, and grit. It is a beautiful story of the amazing life and wisdom of Tommy Raskin, an alarming story about our country and the danger we face, and a story that affirms that what we do matters. In the end, Congressman Raskin's story is one of redemption and of democracy, whereas he describes, and I quote, the good and compassionate people like Tommy Raskin, the non-narcissist, the feisty, life-size human beings who hate bullying and fascism naturally, people just the right size for a democracy where we are all created equal, triumph. But it's a reminder that the triumph is a story that must still be written by all of us. Congressman Raskin, thank you so much for joining us. Congressman Raskin represents Maryland's eighth congressional district in the US House of Representatives. He began his third term in January, 2021. He serves on the House Judiciary Committee, the Committee on Oversight and Reform, the Committee on House Administration, the Rules Committee, and as we'll talk tonight more about the select committee to investigate the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. Before he ran for Congress, Representative Raskin was a three-term state senator in Maryland, where he served as the Senate Majority Whip and earned a reputation for building coalitions in Annapolis to deliver a series of landmark legislative accomplishments. Before then, he taught constitutional law at American University's Washington College of Law for more than 25 years. To kick off the conversation with Congressman Raskin, I'm going to turn it over to my friend, an American Promise board member, Deborah Winger. Deborah has had a legendary career in TV, film, and on the stage. Her work includes Terms of Endearment, Officer and a Gentleman, Urban Cowboy, Big Bad Love, The Sheltering Sky, and most recently, The Lovers and Patriot. Raising three sons, writing a book, teaching a fellowship for Dr. Robert Coles' noted course, The Literature of Social Reflection, producing several documentaries, including the Academy Award-nominated Gasland about the oil and gas industry in her home state, and so much more, uh, including helping to grow and lead American Promise since our launch. Deborah, thank you so much to you. I'm gonna turn it over to you and Congressman Raskin, and we'll look forward to joining the conversation as well. Thank you, Jeff. Congressman Raskin, Jamie, I don't want to place you in a position of spokesperson or worse, an expert. I find that to be a lethal setup myself, but how is it that in one sentence when you speak or on one page when you write or one day in your life and all your events like this one that you so kindly show up for, how is it that you managed to bring your son Tommy's beautiful life the ongoing reckoning with his suicide, political strategies, the constitution, democracy, heartfelt thank yous to people you may not even agree with. How is it that you managed to bring all of that to bear and like your life itself, you synthesize them and you stay whole in such a divided time? How can we learn as well to keep our aim in sight in such a fractured world. <clears throat> so let's dive right in, Deborah. Um, uh, I, I appreciate um, very much your question. Um, and thank you, Jeff, for your kind words too. And um, I'm delighted to be with all my friends from American Promise. And um, Deborah, you know, I don't know the answer to your question. Um, you know, I'll just say that, um, you know, having suffered this catastrophic loss, um, you know, something that um, 
you know, is just utterly devastating. Um, you know, I feel like I, I'm, I'm able to go on and continue doing, you know, the work I was doing and the work I'm doing now, um, basically because Tommy has become, you know, part of me and he's in my heart, he's in my chest. And so um, I've tried to stand up for the things that he believed in and the things he championed. He was a young man of extraordinary moral and political passion um, who had already rendered precocious service to the world in, you know, in just 25 years. So, um, so yeah, I guess it's a, it's just a, a protracted way of saying, I don't know, but I, I do feel Tommy's with me during this time. Well, I know that it, it's, it takes a kind of ongoing work on oneself all the time. And I guess I remember, I remember so much from your book. It, it lives with me in that way. Um, and so I guess thereby Tommy, but I, I remember the first thing I, I remember is the definition of the multiplier effect that you mentioned um, uh, that you came up with, with Tommy, when you were conceding democracy summer. Do you remember that part? It was early, early on in the book, but I feel like Tommy is such an integral part of that. And could you talk to the multiplier effect? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, for me, and this isn't true for any, for everyone, um, it's certainly like not really true for, my wife, who probably has, uh, you know, a, a much better makeup. But for me, I've never really distinguished between what's personal and what's political, what's public and what's private, you know. And um, so, you know, when I decided first to get into politics and I was just, you know, teaching law, um, but I decided to run for the state Senate and the kids were six, eight, and 10 years old. Um, and, you know, Tommy introduced me at my, at my kickoff. Um, and um, so, but you, you're referring to our D Democracy Summer Project, which has since gone on to become a nationwide thing. But at, at that point, I was just looking for a way to get the kids and specifically my nieces and nephews you know, about a dozen young people involved in my campaign. And so I was trying to get them to all come spend the summer working. And, um, you know, the, I got, we, we got back uh, some messages through Tommy that they were saying, well, you know, what are we going to do? Put down on our resume that we worked for our uncle's losing state Senate campaign. And uh, I said, tell them, number one, we're not going to lose. And number two, they're not just coming to be interns. For me, they're going to be part of Democracy Summer. And uh, uh, Tommy said, what's that? And I said, well, we're going to have a school and we're going to teach young people about the history of social and political change in America and all the civilizing movements that have transformed our country. And then we're going to teach them uh, how to be involved. And so um, we were able to get them involved. And of course, their friends got involved and then their brothers and sisters and everybody. And I've never really gone back to the standard model of a campaign. I mean, I don't, I don't use pollsters. I don't use consultants. I don't use uh, TV and radio and direct mail. We just have a school for young people and we get as many involved as we can. I think this summer we'll have about 175 or 180. And that's, you know, families from all over my district and everybody gets involved. And then we have great speakers come. And to me, politics at its very best is really about education educating people about the process, educating people about their rights, educating people about the problems we face, you know, and I, I don't even really like the word issue so much because issues are things that, you know, we just dwell on in order to create division and polarization, but the problems that we need to try and solve um, and what solutions in public policy we can come up with. Well, just, you know, for the record, I dig the term multiplier effect as long as it's not like a sci-fi movie. You know, <laughs> exactly. So you also said something that really caught my eye, my ear, which you said that what your assignment as lead counsel for the impeachment was, quote, a chance to rise up from the despondency and bring others along with me. We all need 
to recognize that getting money out of politics is that same assignment. So do we need an older woman <clears throat> to tell us what to do or when to do it? Well, in, in my case, I did. You know, I, I say in the book, Deborah, that, you know, when Speaker Pelosi approached me, I was not eating. I was not sleeping. Um, I really wasn't sure whether I'd be able to do anything of value or meaning again in my life. Um, and when she asked me not just to be one of the impeachment managers, but to be the lead impeachment manager, I was, I mean, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I was so startled and stunned, but immediately I saw the logic of it. And I, I realized, you know, she was throwing me a lifeline. Basically she was saying, uh, we need you and we need you to, to rally and mobilize. And, uh, you know, build this team and go and tell the country everything we know about what um, Donald Trump had done in inciting and fomenting a violent insurrection against the government. Um, and so, um, Feb, you know, January 6th was the date of the insurrection and the attempted coup, and we uh, impeached uh, Trump in the House one week later on the 13th. And um, that, uh, and then the end of the impeachment trial was on February 13th, one month later. So my book tells the story of the 50 day period beginning with our loss of Tommy, what happened on um, January 6th, and then the impeachment in the House, and then the trial in the Senate. Um, and then it finishes up with a discussion of where we're going and the fact that alas, you know, we, we didn't, uh, we didn't convict him uh, in the Senate. And, uh, you know, it was the most sweeping bipartisan result in the Senate in American history out of the four presidential impeachment trials, uh, Andrew Johnson, Bill Clinton, uh, Trump one and Trump two, um, but we didn't convict him. And so he's still at large and essentially the forces that he represents are still very much out there. Um, and I do see it as very closely connected to the work that American Promise is doing because uh, you know, what we saw was basically a financial takeover of the government and the conversion of the government into um, an instrument of money-making turning the government effectively into a capitalist enterprise. Well, yeah, and speaking to that, because it really is a, a, a financial takeover, a corporate takeover. And, uh, you know, looking back on my texts of last year, you spoke um, of your, you were speaking of your conversations with Liz Cheney. And so it occurs to me that you were like, I don't know, herding cats on the floor during the impeachment hearings and you never seem to give up on the possibility of finding I don't know some common ground you uh you know where do you see us in this moment as far as that goes well um people ask me about that all the time about partisanship uh and political parties and the the way I think of it is that um parties and partisanship um, are part of a healthy democratic process, you know? And, um, you know, one easy way to get rid of partisanship and disagreement is you just get rid of political parties. You move to a one party state, a one party dictatorship, and nobody wants that. So political parties do serve a positive function. They help us to articulate policy ideas and agendas, and they help to educate the public and mobilize people. But you know, but my take on this is that, um, you know, those of us who aspire and attain to public office the day after the election have got to remember what a party is. You know, it comes from the French word parti, which just means a part. Our party is just a part of the whole. And we have to try to speak for the whole, for the common good and for the public interest. Um, and um, so, um, 
so parties will be with us, but I, I do think that we need to have a sense of constitutional patriotism. And that's why, you know, I spend a lot of time praising and lauding Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger and Mitt Romney and, you know, the others who Republicans who did the right thing. I don't agree with them on a lot of policy issues, um, but the point is they're standing up for the constitutional framework. Um, and uh, I'm just afraid that, you know, that Lincoln's party has become Trump's cult of authoritarian personality and um, it has positioned itself outside of the constitutional order. Um, and I just think that that's a, a huge danger to the survival of democracy in our country. So um, I believe that the vast majority of the people still believe strongly in constitutional democracy. They don't accept the idea of rule or ruin which is if my party doesn't rule, if we don't win, we will deny the reality of the election and we will try to trash your ability to get anything done. And we will basically act like enemies of the Republic. Uh, most people just reject that idea. Um, and so what we're looking for is, you know, millions and millions of acts of civic and political courage all across the country to stand up for the constitutional framework and for the common good. Well, I think that's a great moment to bring Jeff in. Um, I know you, Jeff has been <laughs> speaking to this ever since I've known him and American Promises sort of finds itself, you know, this is the center of what we do. So Jeff, I, I wanna turn it to you for right now. Uh, thank you, Deborah. Don't go far because you're going to stay in this conversation. And uh, um, I, I've known Jamie for some years. So when I say Jamie, everyone, it's it's a it's our friendship, not a. Uh, it's a term of endearment. Of, it's a term of endearment, indeed. Yeah. Indeed, and I'm honored to uh, to say it. So Jamie, let me just say this. Um, you know, I want to. We're getting. I'm I'm monitoring the chat. And we're getting a lot of great questions and, and some just wonderful greetings and salutes to you, you should know, and we'll bundle those up and send them to you, um, not to burden you, because we know you tend to reply to everybody's uh, letters and inquiries, so don't feel obligated, but you should know there's a lot of love out there. Uh, All right, well, I'm sending my line. love back. I can't read it because I'm on my cell phone instead of my computer. It wasn't working on my computer, so... Uh, so um, in addition to the love, there's some tough questions. So let me get right to them and send some to you. Um, tough for the country, not tough for you. You've been wrestling with this, but I want to take us to January 6th. You describe it in your book so um, vividly because you lived it. You, you described it from your eyes as you watched and heard and worried and everything was happening around you. And then almost immediately you had to move to investigation, truth, and accountability as the lead manager of the impeachment. And, um, and you write that almost immediately this issue, this attack, which one might have hoped unified us, um, became a struggle, and I'm quoting you, a struggle to protect social memory and historical facts in the face of ideological derangement and disfigurement. If we cannot get the past right, we will get the future all wrong. I suspect it has application to this event and other themes in your book. Can you say more about, about that, the social memory, historical facts, how we resist ideological derangement and getting the future right instead of wrong? Well, I've really come to believe more and more that the struggle to defend democracy and democratic institutions and values is really just a struggle for the truth. Um, because... If you go with Tom Paine, as I always do, you know, the vast, vast majority of people have common sense and presented with the facts of the situation are going to understand immediately what the real truth of the situation is and what the moral implications of it are. Um, that's why the pro-insurrection forces and the pro-coup forces have to lie, because they know that the truth would be utterly repulsive to the vast majority of the country. And I saw on uh, January 6th, when we came back very late at night into the wee hours of the morning, I think we didn't end up finally certifying and overcoming the objections until 
4, 4.15 in the morning. But right when we came back, there were already members of uh, the minority, including Matt Gates, who were in full throttle denial of what had happened and said, you know, the Washington Times is already determined and is reporting that Antifa was the cause of this uh, riot um, and this attack on us. And so, you know, the propaganda began immediately. And to this day, you know, Donald Trump is out there saying that his mob confronted our officers with hugs and kisses and flowers, which is presumably how, um, you know, more than 150 of them ended up uh, in the hospital with broken ribs and noses and jaws and traumatic brain injuries, concussions, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and so on. You know, so um, we live in an age of propaganda and we live in an age of conspiracy theory and disinformation. And the internet, which is this extraordinary instrument of human connection and making the world a, a small place and, and creating great efficiencies in social and economic life, um, has also uh, become this uh, startling breeding ground for uh, lies and conspiracy theory and hatred. Um, and it creates the impression that, you know, millions and millions of people believe in that. And it's not true. Millions and millions of people are falling for Trump's big lie and the propaganda. But I don't believe that tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people accept all of the hatreds and the bigotries and, you know, all of the monsters from the 20th century they're trying to bring back, like fascism and racism and anti-Semitism and so on. I just don't think that's where most people are. But, um, you know, it's always simpler to have a fascistic message than a message that reflects the complexity of pluralistic democracy, where we're trying to defend all kinds of freedoms and all kinds of liberty and social justice. It's just a much tougher message. And it's the one thing I hear most wherever I go, um, you know, how come you guys can't message better? Why can't we have a simple message like critical race theory is destroying America or something like that? You know, well, um, reality is a little more complex than these fascistic messages. But if you can have a real conversation with people and we can put education back at the center of democracy, I think we're going to get back on the growth track to democracy because uh, Tocqueville said in America, voting rights and democracy are always either shrinking and shriveling away or they're growing and expanding. And we've been in a contractionary period where you know, voter suppression and the filibuster and um, the judicial activism and court packing um, and the manipulation of the electoral college are interfering with democracy. And we need to get democracy back on the growth track to protect voting rights, to, to eliminate the role of illicit money in our process. Um, and, you know, we need to start admitting states again. Uh, you know, we got 713,000 taxpaying draftable people in Washington, D.C., uh, who are the only residents of the capital city on earth who are not represented in their own parliament. I mean, can you imagine if you told the people of Paris that they couldn't be represented in the National Assembly because they lived close to the buildings? I mean, you'd have another French Revolution on your hands. You know, we got three and a half million people in Puerto Rico who can't participate. So, you know, and we've got to deal with the money question. And, you know, that's why I'm so into American Promise. And what you're saying. We, we've got to put the, the country back on the path towards deeper and deeper constitutional democracy. Um, in, indeed, thank you. Um, and I, I want to ask you about the select committee. We're getting a lot of questions there, and I know there's a lot of curiosity in the country. I know you've, it's underway. And, um, but before we do, though, I want to sort of move chronologically, stay at January 6th for a minute, because, um, you know, our friend Bill Moyers, has said often that American democracy has been a close run thing all along where it could have gone either way uh, several times. And in your book, you describe some harrowing scenes where it really could have gone either way. And, and, and there are constitutional heroes, if you will, in the moment who did the right thing, uh, you among them and, and Liz Cheney. Uh, um, but I, you know, the Vice President Pence sticks with me your description, I'm not getting in that car. And what if you had gotten in that car and left uh, or, or been taken to a safe place? Um, 
you've got the count done, you certified the election, it moved forward. Um, how close was it? Um, and, and, and what can you say about that? Well, we came very close to losing it all on that night. Um, and it's certainly as close to fascism as I ever want to see my country come to again in my lifetime. Um, and, you know, the story behind it will be told at our hearings, which I think will take place at the beginning of June for the first few weeks, um, and will be told in the report that the January 6th Select Committee does to the country. But um, th there was nothing remotely spontaneous about any of this stuff that happened. Um, there were basically two streams of activity, and there was a systematic, organized, violent insurrection that involved uh, domestic violent extremist groups, white supremacist groups that had been brought in for the purposes of smashing our windows, um, you know, tearing down our doors, assaulting our officers, overrunning the Capitol and interfering with the counting of electoral college votes for the first time in American history, interrupting the peaceful transfer of power. And then the other stream was a direct attack on the election in an attempt to overthrow the constitutional process. It was a coup an attempt at a coup. Um, and it's an odd word in the American political parlance because we usually think of coups as something that are targeting presidents. This was a coup orchestrated by the president against the vice president and against the Congress. And, um, you know, Donald Trump simply had refused to accept the presidential results and to this day refuses to accept the presidential results. He'd been preparing people to reject them when he went around the country saying, the only way I can lose is if this election is stolen, is if there's corruption. And then um, fortunately for us, they brought a whole bunch of lawsuits. So we have more than 60 federal and state judges, including eight who were nominated to the bench by Trump himself, definitively deciding that there was no electoral fraud, there was no electoral corruption anywhere it was alleged. All of it was thrown out. I mean, to the point where it was so fantastical that there were lawyers being sanctioned. Rudy Giuliani lost his law li license because of the nonsense that was being propounded in the courts, but that didn't stop them. Then they just moved to try to get state legislatures to nullify the popular vote and cast electors directly for Trump in swing states that Joe Biden had won. And when that failed because of some other unsung constitutional heroes, then they moved to try to intimidate election officials like Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, who infamously was told by Donald Trump, just find me 11,781 votes. That's all I want. You know, well, I, hey, I'm a politician. That's all I want, 11,781 votes. That wasn't Donald Trump trying to stop election fraud. That was Donald Trump trying to commit election fraud. Um, and so all of these things failed because Americans of constitutional virtue, like Raffensperger, Republicans, Democrats, and events said, no, that's not how we do elections in America. We're not going to become a banana republic dictatorship. And so then it all came down to January 6th, a day traditionally where Congress gets together for 15 or 20 minutes, says the electors are all in, we accept the count, and then the peaceful transfer of power takes place. But the, to, on this day, um, it became the terrain for an attempt to prolong the election to try to get members of Congress not to just accept the certificates of ascertainment sent in by the governors, but rather to vote for who they wanted to vote for, to rerun the election. And then it became a scene, of course, of violence as the effort to intimidate Pence uh, accelerated. And what was that all about? Well, we're just going to get Mike Pence to declare new, unprecedented, extra constitutional unlawful powers to reject and repudiate electoral college votes from the states. And we'll have them start with Arizona, Georgia, and Pennsylvania, thereby lowering Joe Biden's total in the electoral college from 306 to below 270. And when that happens under the 12th Amendment, the, uh, the whole contest shifts immediately into the House of Representatives. And you ask, well, why would Donald Trump and Steve Bannon and Mark Meadows want the election relocated into the House of Representatives where Speaker Pelosi and the Democrats were in control? Well, they understood that under the 12th Amendment, we're not voting one member, one vote.
for president. We're voting one state, one vote. There are 50 votes. And they knew that after the 2020 elections, the GOP controlled 27 state delegations. The Democrats have 22 and Pennsylvania is split nine to nine. Uh, so it's on the sidelines. So it was 27 to 22. And even had they lost, you know, my new best friend in Congress, the at-large representative from Wyoming, uh, Liz Cheney, it still would have been 26 to 23. And they would have run it immediately as the 12th Amendment calls for. And they would have declared Donald Trump president. He likely would have invoked the Insurrection Act and declared martial law, uh, which is what his disgraced former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, had been urging him to do. Um, and they would have called in the National Guard, which they'd been uh, trying to restrain all day um, to come and put down the insurrectionary chaos that he'd unleashed against us. So you're right about Mike Pence. Had he not done what he did, had he caved in, had he not sent us that memo at 1 p.m. saying he could not do what Donald Trump was asking him to do, it would have been a very different story. We would have had not just a violent insurrection that succeeded in shutting down the joint session. We would have had uh, not uh, an unsuccessful coup. We would have had a successful coup. And then it's anybody's guess what would have happened. We could have had martial law. We could have had civil war. You know, because Jim Jordan keeps saying to me, oh, well, you're not going to silence 74 million people. Well, I say, do you think you're going to silence 81 million people? Do you think that the, the people who actually won the election are going to go hide under their beds? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think we could have lost it all. And that's not the way a real democracy treats elections. You know, my party lost an election for governor down in Virginia recently, and we weren't happy about it. And we thought it was based on a lot of nonsense, but effective nonsense about critical race theory and so on. But we accepted the fact that we lost the election. We didn't go and beat the hell out of a bunch of police officers and put them in the hospital and, you know, uh, force them to go to physical therapy three times a week and mental therapy uh, twice a week. Like one of my constituents who's still out on disability from the wounds inflicted on January 6th. Uh, we didn't do that. We didn't lie about the election. We said, all right, so we got outmaneuvered here. Let's learn our lesson and figure out what, how we're going to answer what we consider to be propagandistic nonsense. But yeah. we didn't. And it's like the 2016 election. I mean, there are a lot of people unhappy about Vladimir Putin's cyber sabotage and cyber espionage in the election. But what did we do? Well, a million people put on pink hats and joined Indivisible, but we didn't go out and try to start a civil war or overthrow the government. Yeah, the peaceful transfer of power, it's the sort of only, only thing between democracy and, and not democracy. And um, I, I, I wanna get to um, the committee, the select committee on the attack on the Capitol that you were instrumental in as, um, uh, as, are, as are others. Um, I know you can't share everything yet and there will be public hearings, but I, I have a specific question for you. Can you share anything you've learned or perspective you've had now from going from one who lived through it to having this function of accountability, truth telling, and I think much of the country earnestly hopes recommendations to prevent this from ever happening again. Um, if, you, if you could have added anything or changed anything in the book from what you know now, from that experience, what, what would that be? Can you speak to that? Well, I mean, if anything, I'm, I'm more troubled today even than I was then in terms of the things that I've learned about a premeditated deliberate attack on the constitutional democracy and the way that this violent insurrection that overran the Capitol was interwoven with this inside coup, which the political scientists, by the way, call a self coup. Um, it's not like the military trying to overthrow the president. It's the president trying to overthrow the constitutional order in order to seize the presidency and stay in office against the rules of the electoral process. Um, so I think that um, the story that is going to be told is so vivid and startling. It's basically the greatest political crime of American history. I mean, you, you know, you've got to go back to either the Civil War or you've got to go back to Aaron Burr in order to 
find um, you know, anything in the same ballpark of betrayal as what took place on that day yeah. uh, and, and the dangerousness of it. And that story will be told when, do you think? I'm getting a lot of, lot of, a lot of curiosity of it out here, of course. And yeah, are coming I, in. It, it'll be at the end of May and early June that we start to tell that story. Uh, we will have, I think, I hope, a very effective report that will be, I hope, a multimedia report that people will be able to digest and uh, accept in different ways. Um, but look, what does it mean to be a democracy? It means that the people have the right to the facts about our own government and what's happening. This is a story that people need to have in order to make decisions about going forward. And um, our charge under House Resolution 503 is to tell about the events of the day, the causes behind them, but then also to make recommendations about how to fortify ourselves against coups and insurrections and other forms of subversion of democracy going forward. And we're going to do that. Yeah. Are you able to share any of those yet? Or is that still under deliberation? Well, we, it's still under deliberation. So there's nothing. I mean, I can tell you about some of the things I think that we need to look at. I mean, starting with we need shatterproof glass at ground level and uh, in the second level of the Capitol. And we need to fortify physically uh, the building. But more importantly, um, we need uh, there are some reforms that might be indicated to the Electoral Count Act. But really what we need to do is to strengthen voting rights and the democratic infrastructure all over the country. It's not an easy thing because, as you know, we're a federalist country. And so we have uh, not one electoral system or jurisdiction, but thousands of electoral jurisdictions and systems all over the country. And there is an effort, again, by Donald Trump's party to try to subvert the idea of neutral bipartisan electoral administration. So we need to go in there and defend the whole idea of counting the ballots fairly and producing a result, as opposed to uh, trying to bury everything in partisan propaganda and then pull out the result that a party wants. And that's where a lot of states are headed right now. I mean, one of the things that Trump is doing is trying to purge his party of any election official who stood in his way and wouldn't do his bidding, like Brad Raffensperger, who they've gotten one of my colleagues, Jody Heiss, to run against uh, as Secretary of State. And the ones that they can just get rid of who are in appointed office, they're just getting rid of them. So it's a very, you know, it's a very nerve wracking, frightening situation that and we need, I think, a strong statement by our committee about what's going on and then uh, efforts to combat it uh, in every state in the union. Um, the Electoral College, um, which has always been undemocratic, um, which has given us five, at least five popular vote losers as president in our history, um, twice in this century alone, um, is uh, now a positive danger to us because if you've got strategic bad faith actors in the political system out there, they can transform every nook and cranny in the Electoral College into another opportunity to try to refight the election um, and turn it into a terrain of violence. I mean, the guy who sits next to me in the House uh, Rules Committee, uh, Ed Perlmutter from Colorado, said in the old days, January 6th was a day when, you know, it would take less than a half an hour just to call the votes, call the election, and then there'd be bipartisan drinking and celebration in DC. And now, you know, people are getting killed on that day. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I, I'm going to pass it back to Deborah to um, wrap up in just a minute, but I, a couple other quick questions. One is, um, you know, we see a lot of data and um, it was recently called uh, uh, the, the, the billions of dollars in out of control political spending now since Citizens United and um, the wheels have just come off any kind of checks and balances. It was called recently, a, 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 you know, if, if you run multi-billion dollar disinformation campaigns for 10 years uh, to convince Americans to be scared, angry, enraged, and hate each other, Americans will be scared, angry, enraged, and hate each other that, you know, these, that these attacks work. Um, and, and, and so obviously at American Promise, we're hopeful that part of the reform and the reconnection and renewal of American democracy and reconnection of, of the government to the people, which has just collapsed in a, in a, in a, in a, a depression of civic trust, um, 
will be a, a constitutional amendment that gets that sort of multi-billion dollar disinformation campaign style out and gets more like democracy core or the way you run your races. And so thank you for that effort on the and and hopefully those strands will connect um, about what went wrong with so many Americans being willing to attack our own capital. Um, but also how do we get more constitutional heroes like the Jamie Raskins and the Liz Cheney's of both parties running for office and serving? Well, I mean, the, the great thing about democracy, I mean, we were talking about the, the, the messaging problem where, you know, if you're running a fascistic style politics, it's all just a question of, well, who's the scapegoat this week? Is it critical race theory or is it the groomers or whatever it might be? And you can reduce those things to one, one word. It's difficult to articulate all of the values of democracy, much less the program of democracy, which is all about meeting the needs of the people, which can go from lowering prescription drug prices by giving the government the power to negotiate with big pharma uh, to a universal pre-K program. So, you know, kids at their moment of critical cognitive and emotional development have the investment they need to the issue we haven't even talked about tonight, climate change, which overhangs everything. Well, but the great thing about the great thing about it is that that in defending democracy, people can defend democracy wherever they are. Um, democracy is not just one place. It's not one government office. It's not one election. It's everything. It is the media and it is the schools and the universities and it is um, civic society and it is the counties and the school boards and it's the towns and it is the House and the Senate. So we can be defending democracy everywhere against fascistic propaganda and uh, attempt to you know, turn us into something like Putin's Russia, because that's where it's going. You know, all the autocrats of the world, Putin and Russia and Orban in Hungary and Duterte in the Philippines and Bolsonaro in Brazil and President Xi in China and the, the homicidal crown prince of Saudi Arabia, all of them are rooting for and cheering for the destruction and dissolution of democracy in America, um, precisely because they know what Tom Paine knew. I mean, Tom Paine came over here and he was blown away by what he saw in 1774. He said, the, America could be what the future looks like for everyone. He said, the cause of America is the cause of mankind, the cause of humanity. Um, and he said, we would become an asylum for humanity, not an insane asylum, mind you, but a place of refuge for people fleeing from political and economic and religious repression from all over the world. And we would become a, a demonstration model for how you can build a multicultural, multiracial, um, multi-religious constitutional democracy. And it, it wasn't that Tom Paine closed his eyes at all to the, the cruelties and hypocrisies that abounded when the country started. He was an early abolitionist. He was an early feminist calling for women's right to vote. He understood that, but we started with the right ideas that Jefferson embodied in the Declaration, that everybody's created equal, that we have unalienable rights of the people, that government has got to serve the interests and the rights and the liberties of the people. So we're right back to that basic question. It's the Democrats versus the autocrats all over the world. Yeah. And I'm Deborah. using that with a small d. Small d, yeah. yes. Um, Deborah, back to yes. you. Uh, well, first of all, I think that we should add an amen button onto Zoom so that every time I felt like saying amen, I had something to push. But I don't want to take the zing out of, you know, there's so much going on in the chat and in the questions. I don't want to take the zing out of the, the interest in, in January 6th and, and what's going to be because, and, and the call for it to be on prime time, which uh, the mother of of three sons of different ages, I think would all disagree on what prime time is. So I like your answer that it's going to be across a lot of platforms and we're going to be able to access, you know, and I hope that there's a push for that. But Jamie, you and I have been involved in American Promises constitutional amendment effort. You know, you've spoken at conferences, 
you've shared the stage with Republicans like Al Simpson and my American Promise Board colleague, Jim Rubens, speaking with our members from every corner of the country and every walk of life, right? What is your thinking about how every American, everyone on the Zoom, every American can step into this effort and take action to accelerate the return of power in America to the people to have effective, responsible government and a fair deal for our families and for our communities that you love so much? Well, you know, all of us have to be involved at every level of government that affects us. And that means at the most local, you know, the most local level, we've got to make sure that the practices of our boards of election are consistent with democratic government and sovereignty. And we got to make sure that our state governments are not trying to strip people's rights away. I mean, there is a voter suppression movement across the country that is a fundamental danger to democracy. So we've got to um, make sure we are turning that around however we can um, in every way. And of course, at the federal level, we've got to make sure that the truth is told. And then we make the fundamental structural reforms that are needed about the right to vote, about uh, getting um, you know, Citizens United reversed, um, <clears throat> and um, about dealing with the Electoral College, which is undemocratic. It marginalizes the vast majority of the American people in the general election, because it all comes down to a handful of swing states. Everybody knows what they are. Um, and most people live in a safe red state or a safe blue state. Um, so it's irrational, it's undemocratic, and now it is a, a danger to us. Yeah. I um, would sign up for your electoral college course if you would just, you know, present yeah. it. Well, there's an excellent course in the book, uh, and I urge yeah. everyone to read Unthinkable. If you thought um, the electoral college from a constitutional description and instruction was, uh, would be boring or dry, you got to read Jamie's book of the funhouse mirrors and booby traps of the Electoral College, uh, a very serious issue. Um, Jamie, we're running out of time. I wanna share two things um, for you besides huge gratitude from all of us and, and to you, Deborah, um, thank you. Um, number one, with a hat tip to our senior counsel, Brian Boyle, I wanna let you know that American Promise is creating uh, the Article Five Constitutional Fellowship uh, in honor of Tommy Raskin, um, moved especially by the uh, year-long fellowship he did with the Friends Committee on National Legislation that you described so um, well in the book, um, looking at the democratic arts of education, organizing and mobilizing people for change. So uh, we are inspired and, and uh, inspired to, um, to do that. Um, and we'll keep you posted on, on, on the fellows and hope you'll come back to the National Citizen Leadership Conference and greet some of them and sign some books because we're getting lots of requests for, to see you there and, and sign some books there. Um, and number two, I warned you fair and square that you don't need to take the American Promise Pledge because you, basically the pledge says, join Jamie Raskin. It doesn't literally, but in, uh, in, in getting this constitutional amendment moving so we can get government back to the people instead of the billions of dollars pouring in. Um, but we're about to launch uh, the American Promise Pledge uh, campaign. We invite everyone on the call, sign up April 28th. The launch happens. You can find out more about it. The only way we do this and we get this country back to um, the kind of democracy that Jamie is talking about and so many of us love is to make our candidates and our elected officials do the job. So the candidate pledge advances the American Promise Amendment and the much good work we need. Um, I understand Congressman Raskin, you're gonna be one of our first signers, so. Uh, hey, it, would, it, would be my, it would be my great honor to sign it. And uh, look, if, you know, if, if we don't get a hold of the, the money problem, um, we'll continue to be governed by plutocrats and our own oligarchs. Um, and they will continue to try to suppress the vote, repress the vote and uh, subvert our elections because for them, that's all for show. The, the real power is with the money. 
Um, and we got to flip that around and say, no, in a democracy, the election is where the real action is. The power belongs to the people on a one person, one vote basis. But the reason that they're waging war on basic democratic practices and the right to vote is because they feel as if government is a money making uh, opportunity, that it's fine to have a, a criminal state that uh, is just taken over by certain groups. They govern in their own uh, interests and for the purposes of their own self enrichment. And so you know, we can either have um, a state that's governed by plutocrats and oligarchs and money, or we can have a democratic state where we're struggling always to get better and to meet everybody's needs and the agenda for the whole society. Okay. Well, with that, we will get on the job. It's up to all of us uh, to do that. And Congressman Raskin, thank you so much. Deborah Winger, the amazing Deborah Winger, thank you so thank much. You. Come thank back you. tomorrow. Folks, hold on, Deborah. Uh, well, sorry, say that again. No, I just want to thank both of you for having me, yeah. letting me be in on this. Yeah, thank you, cool. Deborah, and thank you, Jeff. It was a great honor to be with you and all of the amazing people, a uh, part of American Promise. Thank you, thank you, Congressman. And we'll be back tomorrow with Congressman Jared Golden and a Republican State Senator Rick Bennett, who are taking on foreign money and influence in our elections. There'll be a link in the chat for that. Huge thanks to Congressman Raskin, Deborah Winger, the American Promise team, and all of you out there. Let's get to work. We have a lot of work to do. And uh, have a real good night. We'll see you again soon.